We'll begin this uh, press conference now. Our guest today is uh, Jane Fisher, an activist and uh, author, and uh, former Representative Ryochi Hattori of the uh, Social Democratic Party. The subject today is rape and Japan government's response to such things. And our speaker today, Jane, Jane Fisher, will be meeting tomorrow, that's one of the reason we're calling the press conference now, with the members of the foreign ministry and the Japanese government to talk about some changes in the uh, status of forces agreement. I'll let her tell you, explain most more what we're doing. Mr. Hattori has been a big help to her over the years with dealing with the J Japanese government. She's also the author of I Am Catherine Jane, The True Story of One Woman's Quest for Justice, and uh, as you can see, it's in Japanese as well. That's Thank you. Sure. Okay, hello, good morning, everybody. Good morning, my name is Catherine Jane Fisher, and I have been living in Japan uh, since the 1980s. And uh, my children are half Okinawan, but I'm not here to talk about my children today. I'm here to talk about the reason why I'm here. And I have this for you to see. If you are against rape, change the sofa. So I wonder if people can remember when you were six years old. Do you remember when you were six years old? Do you remember when you were 12? Do you remember when you were 20? Well, if we see in the 1955, there was a little girl by the name of Yumiko, very pretty little Okinawan girl, and the United States military servicemen raped her, mutilated her body, and threw her in the trash. And then in 1995, and this is, well, this is, I'm just citing a, citing a couple of cases. 1995, um, a 12-year-old was bound with tape and thrown into the back of a van and raped by three US military servicemen. And then, um, just recently, the latest case was a 20-year-old woman. She was murdered, raped, and left, her body was left to rot in a forest. And when I was raped by the United States military, I actually thought that I was the first person to have been raped by the United States military because there was nothing in the media or nothing was ever spoken about it. And at that time was 2000 and two. So it will be tomorrow, 16 years to the day. So tomorrow, the media is invited to come and with me to while, while I talk with the Japanese government. On the 16th anniversary of the day I was raped will be 16 years that I have been trying to change one part of Article 16 of the SOFA. So why does this Aussie in Japan want to sacrifice 16 years of her life to try and change one word. Well, if you are familiar with my case, you will know that the United States military serviceman who raped me fled the country. And it took me 10 years to locate, it, locate him because the Japanese government blatantly told me that it is not the uh, responsibility because the, in the Status of Forces Agreement, in Article 16, it says you need to respect the laws of Japan, and it does not say obey. So I would like those two words changed. So I have just returned from being a guest speaker at Yale University. So there is a, you can see later, I can send you the links to this latest article by Marina Yoshimura which is the article here called Raped. And it's, it states here that um, why the reason why I find the agreement problematic is um, b because it doesn't say obey the law. It only says respect it. But how do you, how do you uh, sort of like interpret the word respect? 
how do you interpret that word? It's, it's when you're writing contracts, it has to be very clear in black and white that you must obey the, the uh, you know, so to clarify the definitions of that term, this must be changed. And my father used to be a contracts lawyer here in Japan, which is the reason why I was originally here in the first place. But contracts are very, very, um, you know, you have to be careful of any word which is in a contract because it could be changed. So we can notice that recently there is a, a very, you know, big influx of foreign people coming to Japan. Has everybody noticed that? So I think, you know, with this globalization, we, and we have so many foreigners here, and I don't think, you know, the Japanese government has realized that they don't really speak English very well in Japan. So imagine, you know, 70 years ago, it's a chikyote, it's good time, it's good time. Chikyote, it's a dikimashita. Chikyote. The uh, Status of Forces Agreement was in 1960. 60. So in 1960. So imagine in 1960, who was speaking English in those days? And also the reason why I understand, you know, the word respect, I have lived in Japan for almost 40 years. And the way that the Japanese people respect each other is something that I think that the world should learn from. This honoring of people and respecting of people. And so this word in that time in the 1960s, respect, was meant to mean obey. So things can say something, but it's a completely different meaning if people are not listening to that. And so we definitely need to, to change that. So um, as I mentioned before, it took me uh, 10 years to look for the man who raped me. And when I finally found him, I went and had a meeting with the Japanese government again. I've had meetings with them on numerous occasions. And I said that I finally found the man who raped me. It took me 10 years. So would you please send my court ruling to, the, uh, to him now. He's in prison. It's easy for you to find him now because it took me 10 years. I did the, the Japanese government's job. I deserve the, the salary of the foreign minister, actually, because I've been doing their job. So, um, and they said to me, thank you, but we can't send your court ruling to the American government or anywhere because we can't afford it. It took me 10 years, and they couldn't even afford a postage stamp. How about that? This is not only unbelievable, but that is also very disrespectful. And I don't know why that is continuing to happen. So anyway, when I realized that uh, the man who raped me, Bloke Deans, had uh, gave to the judge in Milwaukee some documents which said that United States military had sent him out of the country during my trial. So at that point I thought, right, now I have the truth, the missing part of the puzzle. The United States military blatantly sent him away and now I have that piece. So what would you do? What would you do then? I decided that justice was the most important thing, and of course it always has been, that I said to the man, I told my, sorry, I didn't say to him, but I said to my uh, lawyers, Perkins and Coy, tell the man who raped me that if he admits to what he has done, I'll only accept a dollar. And so I made world history, and I won my case, the first case in believed to be in the world where um, a rape case has been endorsed in another country for one dollar. Taylor Swift actually uh, did the one dollar case after me recently, so um, I'm glad that I have set a precedent for other people. And um, so winning the one dollar, that reminds me of Harry Truman, one of the former presidents. Do you know what Harry Foreman, uh, sorry, Harry Truman, on his desk, he had this. The buck stops here. And seeing I was the one who won the one dollar court trial, sacrificing my life for the country of Japan, that I have the right also to use this. The buck stops here. 
And tomorrow in the meeting, I would like to ask the Prime Minister of Japan to stop passing the buck and take responsibility for all of these crimes that have been happening. I would just like to show you how uh, wide the crimes are. So you can imagine my shock when I realized that I wasn't the first person to be raped. And when I, I will just show you the scroll that I show people. And if I may have somebody to just like help me to just pass this around perhaps. If somebody would just see here. This is the amount of uh, rapes which have been happening by United States military alone uh, since the 1940s. So would somebody, or maybe one of the staff, would you kindly, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, would you just like, uh, just, just show that to the people I need to, oh, from here. Just take this and I will stand up and we can just see. So you can see my shock when, uh, could you, um, okay, thank you. Uh, I need, okay, thank you. So it's quite long. This is the list of the rape and murders that have been happening uh, in Japan. Um, so this is 1952. It's quite long. I'm, do we have all day? Do we have all day to look at this? So. Quite horrific, isn't it? Now, this is only up until two thousand and eight. And people might say it's a women's issue, but actually there were men male victims in this as well. So I would like to also just to cite some other cases. So Oliver Reese uh, was a United States military serviceman who uh, murdered um, a woman in Yokosuka. And uh, then we have Major Brown. He tried to kidnap somebody. Kendrick Leddit was one of the um, three who gang raped the 12-year-old um, girl. Now, when he was sent back to the United States, what did Leddit do? He um, actually raped another woman and murdered her, and then he committed suicide. Now, if you look at the case of Anthony Saul, his last station was Okinawa. And with the Anthony Saul case, um, he actually murdered, I think it was probably around 11 women, and, um, and uh, buried them in his back garden. Is this starting to get a little bit too much for you, all of this talk, may I ask? Can you imagine, this has been happening on the island of Okinawa for over, se over 70 years. Now imagine someone comes into your house and they start raping and murdering your family. Are you going to offer them another cup of tea? Or are you going to ask them to leave? Now, we can say that the, in Okinawa and in Japan and all over the world, people are divided whether or not they would like to have the United States military stay or to have them stay here or for them to leave. That fact is the truth, and we all must agree on that. It's divided. I am not against the Japanese government, nor am I against the United States military. However, they are, it is divided in the world. But God forbid, is it divided that we can rape and murder people? 
So who is going to take responsibility for this? I was just speaking to the, um, the Commissioner of Victims' Rights, Mr. Michael O'Connell, which you're all uh, very welcome to email him later, about how the Australian government deals with victims of crime. Now you can imagine that uh, Rina Shimabukuro's family, um, her body was left to rot in the forest and they were so hurt that their daughter was murdered and raped. And of course they need payments for, to pay for funerals. Can you imagine how would you be able to go to work after you, you, your precious daughter had been raped and murdered? They need to have compensation, don't you agree? So when the Japanese government, the United States military said, we're not paying. They have just recently said, we're not paying. The American military said, because he was uh, working for the United States military, he was a former, you know, mukashi wa gun datta n desu yo ne. Mukashi gun desu da ne, sono kata, shito koroshita shito. Uh, Moto, he, wa he was a former United States military serviceman, but now he's a civilian component. And because of that, the American government said we don't need to pay. So who's going to pay? And the Japanese government said, um, well, they have to pay. Who is going to say the buck stops here? I definitely said that. So um, in speaking with uh, Mr. O'Connell, the commissioner, I said, so what happens in Australia? Well, it doesn't matter if the United States military is not going to pay. Of course, the Australian government is going to compensate the family. For example, um, terrorist attacks. And each state in Australia would be different. but. The principle is the obligation to ensure that the victims of crimes and their families are treated with respect. I had to look for the man who raped me for 10 years of my life. Can you imagine my son when I was raped was not even in elementary school? And my son today is now 20 Two. And I have three sons. But anyway, let's just go here also to, uh, I would like to, to uh, look at clause of the um, United Nation, clause GA resolution 40-34. And this is the United Nation Declaration of Basic Principles of Justice for Victims of Crime and Abuse of Power. And it states that the uh, state has the obligation to pay compensation to the victims of the bereaved, the victims of the, uh, sorry, to the family of the uh, murdered victims. So in 2009, the uh, Japanese government set up the uh, National Victim Scheme, I think it was in 2009. But obviously, how it is planned to operate and how it operates is completely different. So in uh, my case, it took me until, uh, I think, Hattori sama nanen de shitan desu ka ne? Eto, Nihon no, eto, Ministry of Defense, so no, okane ga iteraita. 2008. 2008. So, um, in two th 2008, the Japanese government awarded compensation to me. It took me into 2008 to fight for some compensation. And uh, I did receive some compensation, which helped pay for some of my legal fees. But as you can imagine, um, the legal fees for Perkins and Coy was $200,000. And um, because the because of the uh, Perkins and Coy, they decided that they would take my case pro bono, and so that is how I was able to afford it because of the generosity of the American firm, law firm. So 
あとは羽鳥さんなんかあと30分ありますね。Because as you can see, the rapes and the murders are continuing like a broken record. And I would like to blatantly say to the media today is that if they are against rape, meaning the Japanese government and the United States、um, military is against rape, they will take responsibility. And to eradicate rape and murder, that means they have to start obeying the laws of Japan. Because respect means that they are able to flee. If they do not fail and they fail to do so, then I believe that they do not care about victims. And it is obvious that they do not care if they do not change this agreement.、Um, I also have with me here today a rape test kit. I was the first woman who advocated for rape test kits in 2002. And now the Japanese government is finally、um, making, you know, rape crisis centers are now being available in Japan. But at that time, I was the first woman who said we need to have rape test kits and these. And now that's becoming a reality and、uh, quite late, as I am sure you all agree. So I think we'll be open for questions then. We're just, a, <coughs> just about at the right time. It's one, two o'clock. And、uh, I'd like to, we'll open things up for questions.、Uh, Mr. Hattori, is, you can address questions to him, but he doesn't speak English well. I don't, I don't believe maybe、uh, Jane I can, can translate. translate. So, who, to start things off, do we have any questions? Yes, ma'am. Go to the.、Uh, And let us know your affiliation if you could. I'm a bilingual editor in chief of Yamasaki Journal, and I've been following your case since 2008. And、Thank、I met you. you and Catherine Makino, IPS, when you had an exhibition and the same data over here. Except、uh, it became longer. Shinjuku,、uh, Shinbashi.、Oh. And、uh, at that time, you were so devastated and、uh, angry. And I've、uh, interviewed you, and since then, here you are. About after 10 years,、yes. this book has been published.、Uh, congratulations. Thank you. And my question is now the whole world is booming their campaign, exceptional camp, strong campaign of Me Too. And Japan seems not to have such a excitement and、uh, strong media coverage about this campaign.、Uh, how do you think about it? And also, Tomorrow, when you see、uh, Prime Minister Abe, what would you say and how, what kind of specific、uh, questions or issues you are going to bring、uh, except that sofa issue? Thank you very much. My name is Sarah Yamasaki. Sarah. Thank you.、Uh, I, I think I remember you. I do too. Yes, so thank you, Sarah, for your question.、Um, The Me Too movement. So,、um, in regards to that, if someone says Me Too, then obviously there has to be someone there before you to have said that. And so, to continue just saying Me Too, Me Too, well,、uh, it's, I think that we need to just start taking responsibility. I will、uh, share with you that I almost died last year,、um, I lost 30 kilograms. And、um, dealing with many high profile cases last year, you know, sometimes seven in one month, and seeing there is no 24 hour care for people who speak English, and with the influx of foreigners, if they, I mean, the Japanese government is just going to be more and more embarrassed if we don't set up these centers, which I've been, you know, trying to do since 2002. But、um, I think, you know, the buck stops here, that we have to start, you know, stop. Passing the dollar around. And、um, and also with the、uh, speaking to the foreign ministry's office tomorrow, 
some people were interested, like, why did you do this? Why did you just settle for a dollar? Do you know what is inside the dollar? Inside this one dollar are three things. Human rights, justice, and respect. And so, um, last year when I almost died, I was actually stand, I was in Okinawa, actually. And uh, they said you needed to stay in hospital for two months. And I went to the beach and I said, God, is that all you got for me? I have been trying so hard to eradicate these crimes. I'm trying to, I don't know about you, but how could people sleep at night knowing this? And I have always said, this is not just about me. This is about thousands of people. This is about you. It's not about just one person. It's about so many people. I actually started writing the uh, crimes on I actually started writing the crimes on sheets, the white to represent the innocence of the victims and the, the sheets to represent like why, how could government sleep at night knowing about this? And and I'll just show it to you here. Now, if I was to complete this, it would probably be the size of a 70-floor building. And for the life of me, I just cannot continue to keep writing these crimes. There were um, mothers who had small children on their back, digging for potatoes. Even homeless people who were under bridges who were raped. Um, and the crimes have just continued and continued. So can you imagine um, when, I think it was the, the one dollar had actually arrived from a trust fund, and at that same time, Rina Shimabukuro, the 20-year-old girl, was raped and murdered. And I thought, what has changed? Nothing. So I think it's about time that the buck stops here and we'll say, if you don't change the status of forces agreement, then you don't care. Another question? There's given a lot to chew on here. Are you sure there's nobody else wants to? Do we have any more questions? Yes. No? What? Oh, okay. Yes. Edwin Karam, you're freelance. Uh, I believe that uh, you uh, were, after the uh, that uh, murder, I'm not murder, you were both brought to the police station. Yes. And they asked you where you were hit. And all the policemen came with foot, photo. And Are the uh, reenactment? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Did they, were they punished in one way or another? The, United, the uh, Japanese police? No. Um, when I reported the crime to the police, they told me I couldn't go to hospital. I remember this like the day it was yesterday. When people have PTSD, I will just tell you how, how that PTSD feels. Most of you here, I'm not quite sure, but all of us know what happened in the earthquake with Fukushima. Can you remember that wave? If you just think about it right now, can you see the wave? That's PTSD. I can see exactly what happened on that day. And I can imagine the Japanese police as well, the Kanagawa police. And uh, 60 Minutes did a, a TV documentary about that. And uh, when I went with 60 Minutes to the Kanagawa police station, they said, what are you doing here? Get out of the police station. 
we need you to respect this police station. And the reporter said, that's what we came here to ask you. So, um, and then when I, um, after they finished questioning me for like 13 hours, I think, they said, you can go now. And didn't even give me any replacement underwear. I could not dismiss that. When I found out there were no 24-hour rape crisis centers, that's when I began to to um, start advocating for that. So it's been 16 years now. And um, because of all of these crimes that have been happening in all over Japan, not only Okinawa, um, I decided that someone has to make a stand. And for me to just sit here and say, me too, well, that means I'm not, I'm passing the buck as well. So I have to say, no, and we all have to. This is not about me, this is about all of us. I even carried around these little um, name cards which said, if you're against rape, change the sofa. And I still have a lot left. I printed thousands of them over the years. And, but if something is definitely not working, then it needs to be changed. So definitely the, the way that the system is, it's not working now. So um, obviously something needs to be done. And, and as human beings, we need to, to change those things. And I really definitely do believe that if you change the status of for forces agreement to the word obey, people will start obeying the law. Because if they don't, they have to take responsibility and will be put into prison. Thank you. Satisfied that your answer then. Another question, please. Did you, lady back there again? Go ahead. Yes, yeah, sure. We have a fair amount of time today. Sarah Yamasaki again. Can you send any message to silence victims? Because the majority of the rape, rape victims in Japan has been forcibly silenced by society, community, parents, relatives, mm -hmm. uh, police, as you said. And your case is really uh, rare because you're, you're so strong or you determined, uh, such as uh, uh, Saori uh, Ito's case is unusual because she got the media uh, coverage. There's no, uh, if there's no media coverage, it means there's no record remained and no history and uh, she may keep si uh, silence until she died. So there are tons of uh, silence victims of the world, in Japan especially. So you have any messages to the, those victims who kept silence? Can they, can they, can they do something? Maybe they right. can read your book and what? Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, for the victims here in Japan, we have been, my organization has been helping, and the person you mentioned, we helped her. And um, what I would like to say is, I decided uh, one day that, am I going to continue, you know, uh, printing these sheets? And I decided that I'm not a victim. I'm nobody's victim. I'm not just merely surviving life. I have so much love inside of my body that I think it might explode, explode from my veins. And so I came up with the word empowerterian. It's a new word for the dictionary. And empowerterian means to empower your life, your own life, and the lives of others. So I'm not going to wait around and for, you know, with bated breath for anybody to do something for me. This is my life and I will live it. And I will keep on shining. And if people can't deal with that, then they need to wear a pair of shades. So, um, but if we look here in, um, you know, the reason why I was actually able to find the man who raped me, he was raping other women. And they contacted me. So in the United States, the, you know, sending a criminal, a rapist back to another country, you can see that it's just going to cause havoc in another country. So you have to stop passing the bug and take responsibility where, the, where it happens. But um, I just like to, uh, but you know, I have been intimidated by um, 
secret police, by people who come up on the train and, and I mean, they've been doing it for almost two decades now. I'm kind of like used to it. But why do I have to get used to, to get used to that? Death threats. Um, actually, uh, the United States military, I'd just like to say here, what did he say to me here? Uh, I asked him, I said, you know, um, the main reasons that I feel the status of forces agreement needs to be revised. I was talking to one of the United States military personnel, uh, David Honchel, it's inside my book here. And very nonchalantly, he said, excuse me, but we believe that uh, we have no gain in talking to you. And it was as though he paused, knowing that I thought he saw my jaw drop. And I said, for the record, would you mind repeating what you just said to me? And he said, this time a little bit more slowly so it could sink in. And he said, we, the United States military, have no gain in talking to you. And I said back to him, well, I see. So much for the zero tolerance policy then. I was very shocked and in disbelief about your answer to me. I'm very disappointed. And do you know what he said to me? He said, I thought you might be. So, victims, no gain in talking to you. So I will continue talking to everybody else. If no one in the military side wants to listen, or on the Japanese side wants to listen, but tomorrow we'll have those talks. And uh, if you uh, have some time tomorrow, feel free to come. That will be at uh, one o'clock for 30 minutes. And it'll be the first time that the foreign media has been invited to one of my discussions. So please do come if you have time. I'd Any like questions? to ask one question. Yes. You maybe answered this already, I'm not sure, but the rapist, man who raped you, was extradited back to Japan by the U.S. government? The U.S. government does that or does not do that? The U.S. military did that. Hmm? Yes, they did. Um, and the reason why I can uh, say that with clarity is because he um, said to the United, sorry, to the judge in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and handed them the paper to show that he had been sent out of the country during my court trial. So wasted all of my time, the judge's time, all the lawyer's time, and uh, totally disrespected the laws of Japan. So how about it's time we change to obey? Another question? We still have some time left if, on our allotment, if you wish. Yes, sir? That's a very disgusting uh, question, I'm sorry. But do you think if such uh, attack would be done on the family of a judge or policeman, and if one of their uh, ladies' loved ones were raped, would they be more sensitive? Um, I think that's a pretty easy answer. It's an easy answer, and the question to that is, of course. If, you know, um, so for example, high profile people, they are escorted by police or by bodyguards, right? And that is correct to say. So, but one uh, cannot safely walk in the streets of Japan. Do we have to have bodyguards and escorts? And if we are not able to have these bodyguards and escorts when walking on the streets of Okinawa or in Tokyo or around the military bases, then definitely the uh, Japanese government, the United States military needs to do something about that. That is not our job to take care of their personnel. And we should safely be able to walk there. 
without having escorts or, you know, so if it was, God forbid, somebody who was of high profile, it would be a completely different story. So um, there it comes back to the status of forces agreement, which needs to be changed. So, but um, how can I say, you know, what makes me, an Australian woman, would sacrifice, I would say that the people in Okinawa and the, the ones who are raped and murdered by the United States military, their lives have been unwillingly sacrificed, unwillingly sacrificed, because they have to struggle like I did for 10 years to try and find the man who raped me, and struggle for six years to even ask for a bit of compensation money to pay for the taxis, to pay for my lawyers. However, I, I, I do believe that, um, sorry, I have PTSD sometimes, I lose my train of thought, but um, people should be able to walk on the streets of Japan um, freely and without fear of being raped or murdered. And the victims, because look at it this way, Nobody gets raped or murdered wanting to get money. So why does a person's family, you know, the family of the person who was murdered, why do they have to beg for money for the funeral? Why do they have to spend 10 years of their life trying to, to get justice? It should be handed to them on a platter. We are all bleed the same and we're all the same, we're all human beings. And, and I do believe that these communications have to start talking, we have to start talking to each other. And I hope tomorrow this is going to be a major change. If it takes me another 16 years, I'll still go. But um, as I said, why would one Australian woman wanna do this for 16 years? Well. In 2002, no one else was doing it. But, uh, you know, when I was standing on that stage in Okinawa, it was in Chatan, and I just went back there recently. It was 10 years ago, actually, on March 23rd, that I stood on the stage in Okinawa in the pouring rain in, over, over, in, in front of over 6,000 people. And I said, Okinawa! Okinawa, warukunai Okinawa, warukunai watashi. Okinawa, Okinawa, you are never to blame for this, and either was I. And when I stood off from that podium, sir, do you know there were so many women waiting for me? And one woman, she held out her hand to me and grabbed my hand. And I thought, who is this lady? She grabbed her hand and she said, thank you, Jane. I'm 70 years old and I was raped 50 years ago, but because of you, I'm going to live my life from today. And then I was, you know, I had to be taken away because some of my life was in danger. I don't know what was happening. I was taken away. I didn't have a chance to speak to the other people. But this has just been happening for too long. I don't know how many years of my life I have left to continue this, but I will continue. But I do, I am very, um, I would say hopeful tomorrow that we'll have good discussions because the world is watching and we need to make changes and that's why the buck stops here, using that one dollar which was afforded to me. I think we have time for one more question, if there are any more questions. If not, I think we'll declare this press conference adjourned. May I just say one thing? Sure. Um, for me, the, the pain of all of this, and knowing this, and to keep on continuing to do this without getting paid for 16 years, really took a toll on my life. And um, that's why I had to come up with the empowertarian. But I think that all of us can become empowertarians. We can all empower each other's lives. The Japanese government can start empowering victims because we need to begin empowering society, empowering our communities, 
making it safe for people to walk in the streets. And if we can't make it safe, then to help the victims and help their families if they've been murdered. I don't think that's too much to ask. And so tomorrow, that's what I'll be going to ask them once again. So thank you very much. We're adjourned now. Well, thank you very much for thank our you. speakers. Thank and you very I much. I think we'll call this to a close. Thank you very much. <laughs>